plant nutrition, it's chapter 37. Uh, remember that um, every organism has to get uh, both energy and minerals from its environment. I'm sorry, materials. For plants, remember they get water and minerals from the soil, and carbon dioxide comes from the air. Okay, and remember that in any um, in any organic organism, carbon is the main building block. So the main building block of plants comes from the air. But plants also get water and certain other nutrients from the soil. And many of those all of those nutrients are inorganic. Inorganic. Uh, and again, this just shows a typical cutaway of a plant. Here's where it gets its water and minerals, its leaves, carbon dioxide. So, uh, one more time, plants derive most of their organic mass from CO2 of air. But they also depend on soil nutrients, such as water and minerals. And we're going to talk about a couple uh, important ones of those today. Here's another overview of that. Uh, carbon dioxide in the leaves, oxygen and water out of the leaves, oxygen in the roots. Quick reminder why. I'll let you think about that for a second. And then write the answer. Cell respiration. And water and other minerals come in the roots also. Uh, evidence of that was done with this hypotonic, I'm sorry, <coughs> hydroponic growth where the plant is put in this uh, flask. All the minerals are in there and the plant grows very tall. You could take out potassium, put the solution in without potassium, and you get a much smaller plant. You could do the same thing with other minerals too, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and things like that and see what happens to the plant. So a quick experiment that can be done to test how plants do with different kinds of nutrition. So table 37.1 is an important one detailing the, mac the macronutrients in plants and what they do. Obviously carbon, okay, oxygen, and then hydrogen, nitrogen, potassium, calcium. These are called macronutrients. There are other nutrients that are considered micronutrients. You can look those up on table 37.2 in your textbook. We're not going to talk about those very much in this class. So here's a quick example of three different uh, plants deficient in some minerals. Can be You can see this in their leaves, in this corn, a nitrogen deficient corn, potassium deficient corn, phosphate deficient corn, and then healthy corn. Uh, along with <coughs> climate, plants have to get uh, their nutrients from the soil, and so soil quality is an important uh, piece of this. A couple things about soil. Top soil is the stuff that grows on the top, of course. Uh, rock, living organisms, and decayed organic material. Uh, soil comes in layers called horizons, and if we take a look at the next slide, this is a slide showing digging down, and you can see the different horizons with the topsoil there, and then a loamy area, and then clay down here. Okay, that's called soil horizons, or this is a look at the layers of soil. So what water has to do with this is after it rains, water drains from the larger spaces of soil, but smaller spaces retain water because of, again, Remember hydrogen bonding here, so it's attracted to clay and other particles because they have different charges. This film of loosely bound water is what plants take up. That's what plants take up in their roots. We'll talk, and we've already talked about that in chapter 36. So here's the root hair, here's all the soil particles, and then the water that can be taken up by plants. Okay, an important idea here is the idea that if you have too much water, too much water around the roots of plants, then you can drown it. Because remember, plants also need to have air to take in oxygen. Uh, the next concept is we're going to talk about nitrogen specifically. Plants require nitrogen because look what it's in. It's in its proteins, DNA, chlorophyll, 
Those are the most important organic molecules, so plants must have nitrogen. And this is the one that usually is what we call a limiting factor. How much of it there is in the soil or in the water limits the amount of growth you get from plants. We'll take a look at this again in chapter uh, 51 with ecology. So soil bacteria and nitrogen availability. There are nitrogen fixing bacteria. And again, we'll come back to this idea with the cycles in chapter uh, in later chapters. In the atmosphere, nitrogen exists, but it's not usable. So it has to be fixed. We talk about this in biology one. So there has to be changed to nitrogenous minerals, nitrate, oops, nitrite and ammonium. I don't remember the negatives, this might be negative two, uh, that plants can now absorb those as a nitrogen source. So uh, a lot of um, breeding in plants, we are trying to get them to be enriched in protein. Be, to be enriched in protein, you have to be high in nitrogen. Remember back when we talk about carbohydrates, fats, proteins, proteins contain nitrogen. So if we can get enriched protein of these, now one of the biggest problems for human malnutrition is protein deficiency. If you live in a third world country, you eat a lot of plants, not many animals, you're deficient in protein. There are two kinds of relationships, and we want to talk about a couple adaptations plants have. There are two mutualistic relationships. One is called symbiotic nitrogen fixation, involving roots and bacteria. The second one we've talked about before is mycorrhizae. Let's look at this one first. Symbiotic relationships with nitrogen fixing bacteria provide some plant species with a built in source of fixed nitrogen. Okay? Those organisms are generally like, ooh, I just wrote over that, sorry about that, are generally legumes. Okay? Legumes, peas, beans, and other similar plants fix nitrogen. They're extremely important in our ecosystem because they can fix nitrogen. Along their roots are swellings called nodules. We'll look at a picture of this in a minute. Composed of plant cells infected by a bacteria called rhizobium. So if you were to see, if you were to pull out a pea plant, you'd see all these nodules on its roots. Inside of those nodules are bacteria. What those bacteria do then is as air filters down into the soil, they convert nitrogen into nitrate and nitrite and other things. Then the plant can take up that nitrogen. If you were a vegetarian, what kinds of plants should you eat? Well, you should eat high protein plants, legumes, soybeans, peanuts, and plants like that. Here's another way to look at it. Okay, the bacterioid infects the root hair. Okay, dividing cells, and it shows how it gets this big old uh, lump nodule vest with some vascular tissue in it. So as they do the nitrogen, they can transport it. As they take the nitrogen out of the air, they transport it into the plant. The second kind, symbiotic, so... Uh, what we do then with plants is we rotate crops. Okay, maize or corn is planted for a year, and then the next year, so one that we do around here a lot are soybeans. We plant soybeans in the soil to restore nitrogen in the soil, so we don't have to be constantly fertilizing the soil. We can symbiotic, we can fix nitrogen in the soil by planting soybeans. It's called crop rotation. Mycorrhizae, we've talked about these before, they help plants take up water, but the fungus gets a supply of sugar from the plant. Okay? And then, of course, the host plant gets more surface area for water and absorption of minerals. Last step, there are three uh, kinds of plants that don't necessarily <coughs> use mutualism. Epiphytes, 
parasites, and carnivorous plants. Epiphyte, literally, within or on top of plant. Epi means upon or on top of. Phyte means plant. So an example of an epiphyte is a staghorn fern. Okay? Staghorn fern grows on rocks, cliffs, and trees. And its roots penetrate. It takes nutrients from the plant it lives on. Okay, that's how epiphytes work. A parasite, such as mistletoe, that lovely plant we like to we to have people kiss under during Christmas. Okay, mistletoe's roots penetrate the host plant. Okay, and they stick right into its xylem and phloem. Okay, so they stick into its xylem and phloem. They do their own photosynthesis, but they get their nutrients from this parent plant. They're parasites. Okay, and there are other couple other kinds of parasites here, some that do photosynthesis and some that don't. Last one are carnivorous plants. Carnivorous plants live in low nitrogen areas. But rather than fix nitrogen, they get it by eating protein. They get their nitrogen from eating a dragonfly because a dragonfly is an animal. It has muscle. It has lots of protein or of eating an ant. So things like Venus's flytrap or pitcher plants or sundews, uh, they live in areas that are very low in nutrients. And so like a bog, so they get their nutrients from digesting other organisms. And they have all kinds of cool adaptations that enable them to do that. So we looked at to, to quick review, we looked at uh, the fact that plants need minerals. They get those from the soil. And then some adaptations, mutualistic and non-mutualistic, that plants use to get it.